on this episode of Skeptico. The power of story. You say to him, well, I got to get me a real geek. He says, I ain't I doing okay? You say, like crap, you're doing okay. You can't draw a real crowd faking a geek, you're through. And you walk off. All the while you're talking, he's thinking about sobering up, getting the crawling shakes, the screaming, the terrors. You give him time to think that over while you're talking. Then you throw him the chick. You geek. And how it may be being used against us. This is exactly what the transhumanists are doing. They're harnessing our informational predilections, shall we say, to try and tell a compelling story to push our species in directions I do not think we should go. That first clip was from Nightmare Alley. William Defoe still got it. And the second one was from today's guest, Dr. Rob Williams, who you may remember was on a few weeks ago, but he's back to talk about his book, Beings Human, and about a lot of other stuff that you won't relate to this intro until you really think about it. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome back Dr. Rob Williams to Skeptico. A few weeks ago, if you recall, Rob was nice enough to invite me on his show, Plan V TV, and I really, really enjoyed the conversation that he and Brandon and I shared, and I think we all felt like we wanted to go further, and we will go further, and today is going to be kind of a first step in that. We're going to talk about Rob's new book that he sent me, Being Human, A Most Miraculous Conspiracy. We're also going to talk about his very, very interesting work at the Peak Flow, a wellness company that he co-founded. And if you recall from the first conversation, Rob really makes some amazing connections that I really appreciate and we're going to get back into between breath and health and spirituality, but also with science and environmentalism and some other things that maybe some connections that you wouldn't normally associate. And Dr. Rob does those quite beautifully and quite convincingly, not just a kind of fluffy stuff. What else? Of course, he has a very distinguished academic career at the University of Vermont, has taught courses in a number of subjects, including environmental history, where he got his PhD a few years back. And uh, what else? Who knows? Who knows what else we'll get into? Rob is one of these people, and you'll see from this show, uh, he's just so full of life, so full of energy, and brings forth this light and energy with him. It's just a, a gift and a joy to talk to someone like this. And I love the perspective he brings to some really, really hard topics during some really, really hard times. So part of my goal here is to get Rob to convince him not to secede and, and not to pull Vermont and his cohorts out of the union because we need you, buddy. We, we, we need you. Rob, thanks for joining me, man. It's great to have you here. Alex, it's so good to be back with you, and uh, thanks for making the time. And really looking forward to our conversation. Well, me too. Let's start, you know, it's kind of a natural place to start and a good place to start with the book that you sent me. Tell us about the book. Yeah, I, I'd love to. So begin with the title. It's actually Beings Human, not Being Human. Yes, and yes. Beings Human. We are, uh, it's plural, uh, we are human beings. And uh, the subtitle, A Most Miraculous Conspiracy, refers to the past 300,000 years of team human, homo sapiens, pulling off this, really what I, I see as, as, a, as a miracle. We have become the most successful species on this beautiful planet of ours. 
And it's taken us a while to pull this off. And of course, there are attendant challenges associated with being, with beings human, being the most successful species on the planet. But the word conspiracy in the sense, um, I, I mean it quite literally from the Latin, that we are a species that thrives when we breathe together. And that's the meaning of the word conspiracy, to breathe together. And as a guy who spent a number of years studying what's now called breath work and practicing breathing from an early age, uh, church, um, meditation, uh, fitness, health, it seemed to me, the word conspiracy seemed to me um, appropriate here. And miraculous, of course, because, you know, it could have gone, evolution could have taken us in any one of an infinite paths and here we are, you know? So we live at this really remarkable moment, Alex, as a species, evolutionarily, whatever that means to folks listening. And I think we're at a bit of a crossroads as well uh, for the species, which I write about in the book. And so the book really is my um, meditation on how humans came to be here, what we do really well, identifying this crossroads that we are at as a species and how we might move forward through it. So that's what I mean by beings human, a most miraculous conspiracy. And let me say one more thing. Um, as a breathwork guy, um, I, I, I know that, and you know too, that we humans breathe between 20,000 and 25,000 times a day, which is an astonishing little nugget. And if we see each one of those 20 to 25,000 breaths as an opportunity, which it is because we are one of the only species that can cultivate a conscious strategic awareness of our breathing, then every one of those breaths both solo, <laughs> to your point about secession, both solo and together, every one of those breaths becomes an opportunity to conspire with our fellow humans and indeed the rest of the living planet we find ourselves on, becomes an opportunity to conspire, to breathe together um, with the rest of the planet. And when you begin to see the world in this way, Alex, it suddenly really opens up possibility, it opens up mystery, it opens up potential. And that is incredibly exciting. Okay. <laughs> You've listened to a little bit of Skeptico. So you know that this is all kind of a lead into going Skeptico on you. And that's. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go Skeptico. Because <laughs> cause that's because that's really the, the not only the fun part of this for me, but it's the real part of it. It's the way that. I really connected with you guys. And like one thing that is kind of interesting is the beings human versus being human. I was a little bit dyslexic. So I, I just do this all the time where we just, I just process words differently. I don't see what's there. You know, it's not like a strength. It's just the way that things go, but it is. To be fair, Alex, yeah, it's a bit of an awkward title too, but kind of by design. Yeah, exactly. By design. So yeah. you do that all the time. And I do that all the time. We're <laughs> Yeah, we're constantly poking, we're constantly prodding, and we're trying to put these things together differently. So what I hear you saying in the book, there's some natural kind of, if not contradictions, juxtapositions that I don't think you always play out all the way, because I think even the way the book is constructed, it's you going through this process. Like you're going to have to tell people in a minute about you as a yak farmer, because in so many ways that embodies so many of these contradictions in you, you know, you're a yak farmer. What you're about is to say, these are amazing creatures and look how they are connected to our environment and look at what their environmental connection is telling us about us and our and then you're you're going to tibet and you're going well let me meet with people who've been with these animals forever and let me think and contemplate about what that means evolutionarily you know 
but you don't go too far with that because I don't know what evolution means. And people who study evolution don't know what the fuck evolution means. And I just completed an interview with Bruce Benton, and he has a much better idea of what happened 300,000 years ago and what our genetic decoding is really telling us about quote unquote evolution. And it doesn't look Darwinian, not that there isn't a Darwinian element of truth to it, but neo-Darwinism doesn't get you there. So there's a big question mark, but back to the yaks. I, the Zen of that experience that you're talking about embodies all that. And then what I love and I thought was so beautiful and is Rob, like, I feel like I know you, man, is like, here's a guy and he's not only a yak farmer, but he's got a freaking yak push cart where you can get a yak burger, not because he needs the money from the yak burger, but he's like, this is cool. And this is actually environmentally, if you think it through, like so many few people are willing to do and just want to be triggered. If you think it through, we have to deal with that. And I'm going to put it right in your face to think it through. And then finally, the, the COVID thing hits. And what does Rob do? jump in the car and do a two week cross country tour. You hit all these places I don't know how you, of all these yak farmers in the, in the United States. And you, you're an incredible writer. You write this uh, travel jur journal. That's just a, a page turner. And that's like one small part of this book. So I, I, I'm just trying to pull you in here, buddy, <laughs> but tell me about your yak experience and right. how that fits into being human. Yeah, sure. So let me just say the book, Beings Human, A Most Miraculous Conspiracy, is divided into six, cha six chapters and three parts. And chapter two, the yak chapter, is simultaneously, Alex, the most developed and least developed element in the book because um, that chapter is based on field notes um, from my 15 years of experience with yaks in very rough form. So it reads, as you said, and I meant it to read in its current draft as a travel journal. Someday it will be its own book. I'm in no rush. I enjoy the yaks and traveling, so why rush it? But yes, the yaks have taught me so much about what it means to be human. When you're in the presence of another species and you begin to uh, humble yourselves, let's say, humble yourself before that species and the way that yaks carry themselves in the world. And you can do this with any species. I just happen to, you know, uh, find myself in the company of yaks. Um, you begin to realize again, how little we know and how little we understand about the world. And there's a beautiful phrase. I use it in the book, life by the horns is the working title, uh, of the, of the yak book life by the horns. Um, our hairy, humpy, horny human future and what we might learn from the yak is the subtitle. And there's this beautiful phrase used by, to your point about um, uh, Darwinism and early, um, early cybernetics. There was a, a German born biologist by the name of Jakob von Wexalt, as I think how you say his name, who coined this term called the Umwelt. And the Umwelt means seeing the world through the eyes of another species, or not through the eyes of, through the experience of another species. So I tried to bring a little Umweltian perspective to this book I'm working on about yaks. And then I realized, wait a minute, there are an infinite number, work with me here, of species on the planet. And every one of them is moving through the world each in its own way. And again, what a, what, a, what a beautiful and kind of humbling epiphany to have. It's like, wow. And, you know, we think humans are a fairly diverse bunch. And, you know, if we want to get into evolution and talk about sapiens and Denisovans and Neanderthal and all the other homo hominids that kind of, you know, kind of slept and fought and collaborated their way across the pages of the planet, over the past however many years. Um, again, back to this miraculous conspiracy, here we are as humans for, for whatever reasons that are still, I think you're right, a bit mysterious. Like the evolutionary folk think they have it all figured out, but it's like, no, nah, no, nah, we don't at all, actually. <laughs>
Um, so, so that's what I'm trying to do with the yaks is just sort of bow down before these magnificent creatures and have them help me and, and my readers understand a bit about what it means to be human, seeing the world through their experience. So Rob, when I read that, and when I hear you, I'm going to places that connects your work in ways that I think you are connecting it, but I don't always hear you connecting explicitly. Like you have this whole, you're like a guy with a million projects. Yeah. Here's another one, our <laughs> geoengineering age. No, I mean, you, you laugh, but I mean, this is like, you are uniquely qualified to talk about uh, chemtrails in, in Vermont that you see and experience. And then you're qualified scientifically to say, no, there's a real realness to geoengineering and actually anyone who's even just read the scientific literature i mean these guys haven't hidden it they've published that we're doing geoengineering and you are not totally making the connection that i am explicitly between that and this idea of let me jab you in the mar arm and make you a part of this uh dna gene therapy gene reprogramming experiment and what that means for the yak and what that means for darwinian evolution and alex i should say too the book i just put the book up like a couple of weeks ago and i so appreciate you taking the time to read it in this conversation because i haven't really shared it publicly much um, at all and i sent it to you because i respect you and i really appreciated our first conversation so let's if, if you want to pull up the book cover again let's just unpack the sub subtitle for a moment because i think that directly deals with your question. The sub subtitle of the book is Transcending Human Racism with Curiosity, Compassion, Conviction, and Courage. So you just connected some dots here and let's back up there because that's important. You connected what's happening in our skies overhead in a systematic way with what's happening to the cells of our bodies, to those who have let it be so. Um, and I think to, to, to get a little bit dark for a minute, I think that there is, for Team Human, for Homo sapiens, there is an assault being waged on the species right now. And not just on our species, Alex, but on this beautiful planet that we live in and live on. And that assault is happening at the cellular level. It's happening at the stratospheric level. And it's happening everywhere in between. And the message we are being told, Alex, is that humans as a species are a virus. We are a scourge on the earth. We are a plague. I mean, I've heard these words come out of the mouths of dear friends of mine at cocktail parties right over the past couple of years. It is a form of species side, like suicide, but at a species wide level. And I just find it so strange, Alex, that we, the most successful species on the planet, and we have work to do, of course, um, but we as a species are letting ourselves, particularly in the West, if you will, where we have, I think, for the past several hundred years, celebrated liberties, freedoms. We've tried to optimize the species as best we can to balance, as we say in Vermont, our Vermont state motto, human freedom with human unity. Our motto here in the state of Vermont is freedom and unity, right? We've had a whole lot of unity with the COVID-topian situation, not a whole lot of freedom. So this is what we're up against, I'm afraid, is this kind of what I call human racism. We hear a lot about racism, right? Which I, I think is interesting, but there is this narrative assault on the species. And the other thing that's happening there, Alex, is, um, and I know you'll appreciate this, there are sort of multiple psychological operations happening all at one time. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of James Corbett from the sunny climbs of Western Japan. Um, James and I spoke a few months ago for the first time, and he, uh, he coined a phrase called fifth generation warfare which is what I'm talking about here, this kind of multiple psy psyops that constitutes sort of a, an unprecedented narrative assault on the species, right? 
Um, and again, we see this in the so-called climate change conversation. We see this in the so-called COVID conversation. We see this in the so-called, um, you know, racism or capitalism conversations, right? Okay, so so Rob, I'm with you. For example, to connect climate to transhumanism and globalism is not an easy step for people to make. Yeah, sure. As an environmental historian by training, Alex, I'm very interested in where environmental narratives and explanations come from. And there's a whole history of the emergence of the official climate change narrative that can be traced back to the creation of the United Nations in the 1940s and then the so-called Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the 1980s and 90s. And it should also be noted that there are on record thousands and thousands and thousands of scientists, climatologists, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, who are calling out the nonsense of this official narrative that, that carbon is causing, you know, anthropogenic carbon is, is the prime driver of the warming of the planet right? In the same way, Alex, let's connect a few dots here. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of scientists and epidemiologists and virologists and doctors who are calling out the nonsense of the official COVID narrative. And not coincidentally, Alex, the folks that brought you the official climate change narrative are more or less the same folks who brought you the COVID-topian narrative. And the connection there is that you should surrender your rights in order to globalize, in order to be controlled more easily, readily by some higher power on earth here. And, you know, the other point that I always want to make, because it, it's been so fogged in people's mind to use a climate term, but like you immediately went to the carbon issue. I am still amazed at how many people have lost sight of that. So how have you walked that path with your friends and your colleagues in academia? I mean, that's a tough road to hoe right there. It really is. And there is a whole industry globally of research and funding. And this is part of the game, Alex, as I know you know, around supporting, buttressing, if you will, this official narrative. And once you're in that game and you depend on that game for your bread and butter, Alex, it's very hard to extricate yourself from that game. And let me say one more thing about carbon. Um, we talked about this, I think, last time just a little bit, but we are all, we are carbon based life forms. And carbon dioxide, believe it or not, um, and I say this as with my breath work coach and professor hat on, carbon dioxide is actually one of, in many ways, the most important respiratory gas in our bodies. It's not oxygen. Um, it's not the absence of oxygen that forces us to breathe. It's the presence in our bodies of carbon dioxide that triggers our body's desire to breathe 20,000 to 25,000 times a day. So these people <laughs> who are waging this kind of uh, human racist war, if you will, on the species are hellbent on demonizing carbon and carbon dioxide, which is in many ways, one of the very foundations of our lives and our breathing. It's very strange. Well, it's, it's part of the method, right? Part of the method is to kind of create simplistic understandings of complicated nuanced topics. So you're not saying that a, a dramatic increase in carbon in our environment wouldn't have effects, you know, of course it would, that's never been the issue. The issue is wh what is our relationship to carbon in this more holistic sense? But the leap that they're making is this transhumanist globalist agenda, which is now laid bare by the pandemic, where it's just clear. It's like they're not even hiding anymore. It's like we want to control more and more aspects of your life to the point where a one world government is not even like discussed or debated. It's just a natural falling out of this. And uh, I'm probably touching on issues that should be so basic to anyone. But whenever a problem, quote unquote, is put forth, 
for which the only solution apparently is some kind of global response, the alarm bell should go off. So that's what connects climate with virus. It also connects it with ET and the phenomenon that is now public, right? Yeah, they're trotting out the alien invasion scenario to continue this quest to to unify at a global level, if you will, right? If the virus doesn't work and climate change doesn't work and you know woke uh, woke topianism doesn't work and we we always have the aliens to fall back on, yeah. And this is why I'm a secessionist. I'm a decentralist, Alex, because really the the, the most powerful antidote I think to this kind of attempted centralized control is to decentralize. And that begins with each of us as individuals optimizing our minds, our bodies, our spirits, and then conspiring with our fellow humans and the rest of the species we find ourselves living with to try and optimize the places where we live um, locally, right? And that's not to say that we don't, of course, carry on this global conversation that is so important right now. I think as we stare this uh, this monster in, in the face, right? And you, you called it out earlier, this desire to turn humans into transhumans. Uh, and we should talk more about the implications of that. Well, let's talk about it right now. But I think it's more than the implications because, I, and this is where I think we get hung up and the discussion, I think, falls flat sometimes or turns in a way that it shouldn't. You know, I recently had an interview with Dr. Dean Radin, and I keep referencing this interview because I was so blown away. He's so phenomenal in what he's done and the work that he's done in parapsychology, and particularly the work that he's done in dispelling this idea that we aren't really even here anyway, so what does it matter? Which is a key part of the transhumanism agenda. That is the, you are a biologic robot in a meaningless universe. And if you think about it philosophically, in a lot of ways, that's the cornerstone to transhumanism. You're not real because if you are more, if you are this spiritual being, however you understand that to be, then you're much less likely to kind of just fall for all this stuff. You just don't do it. You're right, Alex. Central to an understanding of this current historical civilizational, some might say evolutionary moment is this question of transhumanism. And I write about this in the book, Beings Human, A Most Miraculous Conspiracy. The American poet Wendell Berry has this beautiful moment in perhaps his most important single book, um, a, a book entitled Life is Beautiful, where he's writing about the problems of giving our lives over to reductionist science. And the book he writes, Wendell Bear, the poet, is a direct critique of Harvard entomologist E.O. Wilson's consilience theory that science, Wilson at Harvard argued, should be the unifying matrix for understanding everything, which of course is terrifying. Um, and, and Barry warned about this, the great uh, Christian theologian, C.S. Lewis, famously warned about this for decades um, in his writings, and I, I could go on. But the, the Wendell Berry writes in Life is Beautiful, in the middle of critiquing E.O. Wilson's consilience theory, he, he, he says, I can imagine in the not too distant future, humans having to choose between living as creatures and living as machines. And this to me is the fundamental question of our moment, Alex. Will we as team human choose to live as creatures? Think about what that word means, creatures, with a creator, whatever that means to you, and obligations perhaps to the other creatures on our planet we find ourselves in the midst of, or will we as the transhumanists wish, will we choose to live as machines, creatures or machines, Alex, and will there come a point when we're not given the choice? So this is a very serious, I think, crossroads for us, and most people don't think quite get it. But but let me just say that the, 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 if there's one person to watch in this matrix, it's the public intellectual Yuval Noah Harari, 
who wrote. Don't go there, uh, Rob. Very, Don't go there. Well, let me just say something about Harari and then we can we can we can we can go. Yeah. You know, Harari wrote a best selling book called Sapiens. I'm sure your listeners, your viewers are familiar. And the thesis of that book is that humans became the most successful species on the planet because we cultivated the ability to collaborate flexibly in large groups around shared stories. And I happen to think he's on to something with that thesis. But of course, then Harari wrote two more books, Homo Deus, Humans as Gods, and his most recent book, 20 for, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And it emerged, Alex, that our friend Yuval Noah Harari is a transhumanist and a dataist disguised as a historian. Let me play a clip, Rob. This is from my interview with Dr. Gregory Shushan. We don't have any answer in the Bible what to do when humans are no longer useful to the economy. You need completely new ideologies, completely new religions, and they are likely to emerge from Silicon Valley. Everything that the old religions promised, uh, happiness and justice and even eternal life, but here on earth, with the help of technology and not after death, with the help of some supernatural being. What are humans for? As far as we know, for nothing. I mean, there is, <laughs> there is no great cosmic drama, some great cosmic plan that we have a role to play in it. Uh, this has been the story of all religions and ideologies and so forth. But as a scientist, the best I can say, this is not true. So Yuval Noah Harari is officially a historian. What's so curious about him, Alex, and I've watched him very closely now since the emergence of this COVID-topian situation. It is clear for reasons I don't understand that either he has been recruited or has volunteered to serve as the chief global public intellectual at the tip of this COVID-topian transhumanist technocratic spear. And so when Yuval Noah Harari parachutes into Davos to talk with you know, all the billionaires who've flown in on their private planes to you know, plan the future of the species, or gets invited on any one of you know, hundreds, hundreds of prominent talk shows, lectures, what have you. It's very clear now, Alex, that he is using his position as a prominent historian speaking on behalf of the history of the species to essentially throw us under the bus. That's what he's doing. And he's doing it in the name of this new ism he calls dataism and this ideology of transhumanism that we can use th through merging the species, Alex, through merging humans with our machines, we can optimize the species and solve the world's pressing problems like, oh, I don't know, viruses, epidemics, climate change, racism the excesses of capitalism, patriarchy, blah, blah, blah. I think it's deeper yeah, than please. that. And I think it's subtler than that. And I think that, you know, what I want to connect this to as well is, you know, I wasn't aware that you were a Christian and I read that in your book and I want to explore that further. I don't want to do it in a way that, you know, is too offensive because I would naturally, that would be my way of talking about it. I just do not respect religious beliefs any more than I respect int other intellectual beliefs. Why should Christians get a pass over atheism? I think atheism is an absolutely absurd proposition. It's been falsified not only philosophically, but experimentally. So anyone who approaches me from a Christian perspective, and they're into uh, a Christ consciousness, spiritually transformative experience, that is, and I don't know what that means, but I take that to mean that they've had an experience in an extended consciousness realm, which my research tells me it's real. The guy we just saw on camera, uh, Dr. Gregory Shushan says, when we look across culture, across time, it definitely seems real in all the ways that we'd measure it. So I'm open to Christians in that way. I am not open to Christians in their goofy Christian apologetics, who that is a soft spot for them. But I feel like 
Christians don't have a way of really standing up against this silliness that Harari is pitching. And as you mentioned, yes, he is on 60 Minutes. Yes, he is endorsed by Barack Obama, by other former presidents. And yes, okay. he's he's a, a, a wonder child of Zuckerman and Gates and all the rest of these people. And he sold 30 million books. Not many people can stand up to that. Christians are fundamentally coming from a more a, a less wrong position than Harari. Harari, to use the, the cute phrase, is not even not even wrong. He's not even in the ball game because he isn't uh, willing to acknowledge consciousness. That is that you are you. That that voice inside your head is real. That you are making choices. That you have free will. He is not willing to go there, and he's using your religion. As a, and the soft spots that it has as a way of pulling the wagon. He goes, come on, you don't ever believe that Christian nonsense, do you? The smart team over here, the scientists, I can't tell you your life has meaning, so there's no meaning to your life. This is the, this is the game that's being played and it's not like he changed uniforms in the middle of the game. He's had that uniform on the whole frickin' time. Yeah, I would agree. And, you know, to your point about religion, I religion um, from the Latin religare, which means to bind together, I see the role of religion in the human experience as providing um, uh, protocols, if you will, or providing um i'll use the word stories um to help humans optimize mind body and spirit and let me connect a few dots here in in my study of breath work and, and my work in the environmental history space um i've run across a beautiful book you may be familiar with james nestor's book breath the subtitle of which is the new science of a lost art and in this book, Breath, Nestor has a number of really beautiful revelations about the human experience and, and breathing. One of the most profound is his discovery that at the center of every major religious tradition around the world, Eastern, Western, indigenous, you will find at its core a chant or a prayer or a mantra or a song that runs about 10 seconds in length, which as it turns out, science reveals now, is the optimal length of time for an inhale and an exhale of the breath. It's, it's what we call coherence breathing in, in the breath work world. So let me give you an example. So I'm chasing yaks up in the Himalayas, right? And I wander into these Buddhist monasteries in the middle of nowhere. And the monks are all sitting around chanting. And, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a white guy from Vermont. What do I know? But I sit down and I just sort of, you know, close my eyes and sort of try and absorb what it is they're up to. And it's incredibly powerful and compelling and mesmerizing over time. And as it turns out, the central chant in Buddhism goes like this. And I'll, I'll put up my fingers to indicate the seconds that go by. Ready? Oh, mani padme. Oh, oh mani padme. 10 seconds. And you can find a prayer or a chant or a mantra just like that in every major religious tradition. So what this suggests to me, Alex, is that religion actually, part of, part of the development of the religious traditions that undergird so much of our human experience was to remind humans to optimize themselves, beginning with the most fundamental thing that we do, which is breathe. I, I love all that. But, and a big but, the other purpose of religion is exactly what we've been talking about this whole show. It's about social engineering. It's about a control mechanism. It's about a more effective means to get what I want out of my population than sticks and swords. And unless we're willing to dive into that, and unless we're willing to separate that now, 2,000 years later, then we're going uh -huh. to be we're going to be susceptible to 
the game that Harari is playing in those clips that I said, which is lead you in, let me lead you in with all these things that are true and let me get you, this is persuasion, this is sales, this is what I used to do in business. I get you to say, I get you to yeah. say yes, yes, yes. And then I hit you with, and Jesus died on the cross for your sins and resurrected 2000 years, changed history, son of God, do what the fuck I say. And you're like, yes, yes, yes. Christian apologetics is part of this issue that we need to deconstruct. If we are going to have this spiritual freedom, independence that we're seeking, then we can't just sit side by side with the Buddhist monks and say, hey, that's great. And like we all like to do, then pat them on the back and say, well, you go your way and I'll go mine. But what I really think is my way is best. We're going to have to get to some core understandings of what it means to be a spiritual being independent of these traditions that are are just nonsensical from a logic and a reason standpoint what do you think i know i'm, I'm punching pretty hard here. no I, I i really appreciate i really appreciate your critique and and for me and i wrote this in the last chapter of the yak book so far called um so so each chapter of the yak book suggests a yak like quality that we humans would do well to imitate and the last chapter of the book so far, chapter 11, is called Stay Spirited. And at the root of the word spirited and at the root of the word spiritual is the Latin spira, which means to breathe. So I am much more comfortable, as I think you are, Alex, not talking so much about religion, but about matters spiritual. So we respire, we breathe again and again. We, in, we, we, we conspire right? A most miraculous conspiracy. We breathe together as humans in conjunction with the rest of the living planet. And we inspire. What does it mean to inspire someone else? It means to energetically in their presence, breathe in such a way that they want to take you in, right? Someone who inspires, if you Think, think of your own experience. Whoever you find inspirational, Alex, is somebody who, whose breath you want to draw in. It's sort of the meaning of that word inspire, which I love. And humans, again, we're at our best, I think, when we are in the business of helping each other optimize to become the best humans we can be. Not just body, not just mind, but spirit as well, which as the quantum phys physicists and the mystics have said forever, and the scientists are catching up, cannot be separated ultimately mind and body and spirit um so again this is a grand mystery with a capital m and to pretend that we can understand it number one and reduce it in a reductionist way to language or mathematical equations or a single virus in our bodies or a single greenhouse gas in the sky is incredibly dangerous we're tampering with we're tampering with the mystery and again, we'll we'll have to push Rob in a minute to tell you how you're going to be able to get this book and have a chance to read it. And it's again, beings human, a most miraculous conspiracy. But one thing I love about the book, and you can tell from Rob, he is so well versed and such an agile thinker on just all these diverse topics that he weaves together in a very meaningful way. And I say that as a segue to talk about uh, another part of the book that I thought was just really, really interesting and incredible and inspiring. And it's about page 50. You say, to be clear, our brains do not process, retrieve, or store memories. Our brains are not computers. In fact, storytelling is an embodied energetic phenomenon as ancient mystics and cutting edge neuroscientists both tell us. So, I want you to talk you you again are with just a few words and in a kind of provocative way challenging how we understand storytelling so let's talk about that for a minute what's your spin on that yeah so we know from studying the way that the body communicates with the brain um that that information travels in our bodies electrochemically, number one, we're all beings of frequency. We are bioelectric creatures of resonance. And not just humans, but all living things are connected 
uh, via the, the power of what some would call back in the day electromagnetism or electromagnetic frequency, what have you, which by the way, is a much forgotten phenomenon in our age of materialistic science where we're lumbering robots to quote Richard Dawkins, or we're just clumps of cells. And, you know, to your, back to your question about stories and, and how we process them. Again, if we begin with the breath 20 to 25,000 times a day, and our breath is a powerful way of influencing our, not just our body, but our mind and our spirit as well. And we think about the role of information, a word we kind of throw around, you know, I need more information about COVID. I need more information about climate change. What we mean when we say that, Alex, quite literally, is the, the, the stuff, the, the, the stories that we breathe into our bodies that literally form, form our bodies, our minds, and our spirits, because we're learning from our understanding of how the body communicates with the brain, that most of this communication actually occurs from body up to brain, not from brain down to body. So literally the stories that inform us, Alex, are not, they don't happen up here in this, the most complex living thing in the known universe, the human brain. They actually happen as part of a much more holistic moment by moment experience. And we all know this when we're in the presence of other people who are inspiring storytellers, charismatic storytellers. They can inspire in us hope or fear. This is why the COVID-topian narrative, the, the leveraging of this story of this virus has been weaponized. It's taken um, what we humans do best to collaborate flexibly in large groups around shared stories. It's provided a very powerful, very scary narrative, this COVID narrative, and weaponize that story against us because we humans respond informationally. We respond to the stories that we're constantly being presented with. And what I thought was particularly insightful, and again, you do this in a few words, so I really want to pull this out of you. I don't know if we can do it today, but you connect that word, stories, which we've all heard kind of a million times and how we relate to stories, to epigenetics to energy work, to, and then I'd connect it to like Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz, UCLA OCD expert who did this extensive work with mindfulness meditation as a cure for, or to relieve the symptoms of obsessive compulsive disorder. And he was successful at it, but the way that he was successful at it was to show that that mindfulness meditation remapped physically the structure of the brain, which now creates this chicken and the egg problem, which we all know if we have this kind of expanded understanding of consciousness is, I think therefore I am, or I am therefore I think is, becomes a real kind of question. So dive deeper into what the story is doing. Well, I, yeah, I'm not sure that I can prove that. I do think, however, though, that what we're learning certainly from our study of breath work and its impact on various bodily systems, the autonomic nervous system, the circulatory system, the respiratory system, right up into our brains and sort of our entire sort of nervous system, all the way out to every living cell in our bodies, that how we breathe, Alex, moment to moment, and we should tie this into consciousness too, and, and I need your help with this, but how we breathe moment to moment and the, the habits that we cultivate around how we breathe our way through the world that influence not just our bodies, but our mind and our spirit as well. These habits of breath inform us and the stories that we breathe in also inform us. And when these stories that we breathe in become when there is, let, let me put on my propaganda professor hat on for a minute. When these stories that we breathe in, these sort of one-sided narratives, let's say, these forms of propaganda, when they continually inform us over and over and over again, our mind and our body and our spirit begins to take on the characteristics, the reactions to that particular story. 
And this is back to religion. I think what the ancients understood is if you can present a civilization with powerful stories of human optimization, right? And I agree with you about this is a form of social engineering. We have to be careful here. But if we can figure out ways individually and collectively to encourage each of our fellow humans to optimize themselves through the sharing of these stories, through conspiring together. That's what our friends are doing with the Great Reset. You don't realize it, Rob, but this is for your betterment. You will be better. You will be happier and better. So no, I'm not on the wagon here. I think that there is that New England toughness of we must follow, we must seek the truth at all costs. And we already know from epigenetics that those stories are passed on whether we want to or not. Yeah, and to your point about, you know, this is exactly right, what the transhumanists are doing. They're, they're, they're harnessing our informational predilections, shall we say, Alex, to try and tell a compelling story to push our species in directions I do not think, and I believe you do not think, we should go. And so what do we have to tell a better story, I guess, Alex. And I know you're familiar with the work of Rupert Sheldrake, because the introduction to your last book, you know, his theory of morphic resonance, which I bring up in my book a little bit, um, is one perhaps uh, explanation for this phenomenon that you're trying to tease out of our conversation here. How, how do we, how do we pass on information generation to generation that is going to continue to help humans to optimize and not fall prey to whatever social engineering, whether it's organized religion, whether it's the transhumanists, which I would argue is a form of organized religion, right? This is, this is the challenge before us. And I think the first thing we must do, or a first thing we must do, is learn how to breathe here now, I like to say, right? To use our innate capacities for human self-optimization to really toughen, you just said it, toughen ourselves up body, mind, and spirit. Right, So we can cultivate curiosity. We can cultivate compassion. We can cultivate conviction. And we can cultivate the hardest of all when we go public, we can cultivate courage, right? Literally that, that, that rage of the heart that we are a member, we are all members of a species that must be defended in this moment rather than subject ourselves to this kind of human, as I call it. Well, that might be an awesome way to wrap it up. But there's one other thing we're going to bring to that is Rob is coming out to San Diego. And we're going to jump in the in the cold, in the cold, as he likes to say, and uh, it's cold. ice is nice. <laughs> we're going to have that exchange. We're going to have that exchange of information. So stay tuned, everybody. There's there's more to come. And we're probably going to do uh, uh, another show with uh, Brandon, bring him back into this mix as well. Again, I hope you've enjoyed, you know, this great guy, such an interesting guy. The book, tell us about how people are going to be able to get this book, Beings Human, A Most Miraculous Conspiracy. You got me a pre-release copy. How are people going to get the official thing? Yes, for now, the book is available for free read at uh, my website. It's drrobwilliams.com. Thanks for putting the the link up there. Just go to the blog. Um, you can read it there on Issue, which is a magazine and book publishing platform. I've published a number of books, Alex, and I'm at a point in my life where I'm just interested in in being as useful to Team Human as I can be. So read it, share it, spread it around. Um, most importantly, I hope we'll listen to one another and share information and really hold space for each other right now, Alex, because it is a very strange moment for Team Human. And we need all of our best, um, all of our best breathing together, all of our best conspiring to, to, to uh, gird our loins, as I like to say, for, uh, for this strange moment, my friend. Awesome. Awesome. Well, terrific, Rob. Thanks again so much. We'll, we'll be in touch. I look forward so much to meeting you in person. So take care. Same, Alex. I look forward to meeting you in San, sunny San Diego. And uh, thanks for having me today. And we'll continue the conversation on the best coast. Thanks again to Rob Williams for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I tee up from this interview, 
Do you think the transhumanist agenda is as it was framed up in this show? Or is that just a head trash story that we're creating? Let me know your thoughts. Love it when really, really smart people join me in the Skeptico Forum for real conversations. I'm waiting for you over there. So that's going to do it for this one. Until next time, take care and bye for now.